Yo, what you in prison for? Me? Yeah, you. Drug charges and arson. Oh, you mean when you drugged that little boy in the woods and gave him some fire ass head? What's up, everybody? So I know that intro was kind of like making a joke. That was actually some shit like me and a couple of my homeboys used to say in prison to people like when we were messing with them. But this episode is going to be a serious episode. So there's a guy by the name of Jason Vukovic, is otherwise known as the Alaskan Avenger. And he handed out justice to child molesters. And that was because, you know, he had a messed up upbringing growing up. But I'm going to drop a story right now explaining kind of how he grew up and what his charges entailed and where he's at now. After that story, I'm going to air an interview with his sister. So stay tuned. Jason Vukovic was born in Anchorage in 1975. He said he never knew his biological father. Around age four, his mother's husband adopted him and began abusing him later on. Vukovic said, both of my parents were dedicated Christians and had us in every church service available, two or three each week. So you can imagine the horror and confusion I experienced when this man who adopted me began using late night prayer sessions to molest me. Also, he beat me with a custom two by four. Vukovic identified his adopted father as Larry Lee Fulton. A court document filed by Vukovic's attorney in an earlier criminal case also details his childhood of abuse and molestation by Mr. Fulton. Mr. Fulton was found guilty on a second degree sexual abuse of a minor charge, but received a three year suspended sentence, meaning he didn't have to serve any active time in a prison cell. Vukovic said that after the sentencing, his family moved to Wasella and he was homeschooled. He said he received no counseling. It was like they didn't care. No one ever checked in. Vukovic states, when I was a little kid in my house, if some tatted up guy would have kicked the door in and beat up the guy that was molesting me, I would have said, yeah, whoo, I knew it. I can't believe it. Thank God, because nobody cared. His brother ran away and later he did the same. I'm sure Jason was happy to hear his stepdad Fulton is dead. His mother wrote him in prison, saying his ashes were scattered across Alaska. Vukovic said he moved to Washington State around age 16 with no form of identification. He started to steal to support himself, mostly from gyms where he knew people left their wallets unattended. From that point on, I turned into a thief, he said. He said he was arrested for the first time about five months after he got to Washington. Then again, nine months later. He said he was worried that if he went to a homeless shelter or somewhere else to get help, they would call his parents and send him home to Alaska. So he just kept stealing. Being a thief and a liar fit nicely with my lack of self-worth and my silent understanding that I was worthless and nothing but a throwaway. Vukovic said he spent later years moving often following construction jobs. If he got laid off, he would just return to stealing. Time and again, my choices reflect a lack of concern for myself and others. Many, many nights, I simply just wanted to die. When people don't have the opportunity to address childhood issues, they don't behave well. Vukovic certainly didn't, but he needs help. The cycle will continue, not just for Mr. Vukovic, but for others, if we can't do something to stop it. He said he hopes one day to have some freedom, but what's important to him is to share his story so people avoid the pitfalls and traps he walked into when he channeled his pain into a hate crime. He advised people who have suffered abuse to talk to someone who loves them, not to act out. Vukovic began serving his life sentence many, many years ago. It was handed down to him by an ignorant, hateful, poor substitute for a father. He now faces losing most of the rest of his life due to a decision to lash out at people like him. To all those who have suffered like Vukovic has, love yourself and those around you. That's truly the only way forward. Now back in the summer of 2016, he carried a notebook with a list of names including Charles Albee, Andres Barbosa, and Wesley Demarest. Over five days, he entered the homes of three men uninvited and hit them, sometimes with his fist 
and in the case of Demarest, with a hammer, knocking him unconscious. He also stole from them, taking items including a truck and a laptop. Vukovic said that he targeted his victims based on their listing on the Alaska Sex Offender Registry. The online registry includes their home addresses, work addresses, and convictions. Vukovic carried out his first attack the day after he got out of jail. He said he had heard about the three men through the grapevine, but did not know them personally. He said he felt like he had to confront them, so that's exactly what he did. What's up, everybody? I'm blessed and free. Welcome back to another episode of DOC TV. I really had have a passion of looking up like famous crimes and just I've always like been into true crime. And you know, about two months ago, I was on the internet. I'm searching some stuff, and I ran across the story, the Alaskan Avenger, and his name's Jason Vukovic. I found his sister, so I had reached out to her. Instagram foundation and I was about to drop the episode and boom, we, we get connected and she's going to explain some stuff that I didn't know because the media doesn't always give you the exact facts of each case that they're covering. They, they just tell you what they think you want to hear. So um, I just want to introduce you guys to her. Her name's Angelina and she's going to give us the real raw dog truth about what happened with her brother. Why don't you tell them, you know, a little bit how you grew up and how this all came about for you in your life? Absolutely. Yes. So, um, so my mom, I, ne I never met my father and my mom passed away when I was six and all growing up, my, my, my family had told me that my dad had two sons and I had two half brothers out there. And I searched for them for 16 years and I was never able to find anything. So in 2017, um, I, and, and all growing up, I thought that, you know, I had the sh crappy end of the stick, right? Like, right. because I didn't have a mom, I didn't have a dad, you know, all of that. And I'm just sitting here thinking that my, my dad and his wife and my two brothers are this happy family. And finally in 2017, I bite the bullet and I signed up for ancestry.com and I end up spending three days on the computer and finding my brothers. And wow. I, yeah. And so I find that Jason's in prison and why he's in prison. And I was absolutely devastated, heartbroken wow. um, when I, when I read his story and um, so his story goes that our father, their mother had my two brothers. So we have an older brother named Joel and then there's Jason, the younger brother. When my, um, when Jason was about three years old, our father, and he's, he's 10 years older than me. So I wasn't even thought of yet when he was three years old. Um, our father had an affair with another woman named Marietta, who's actually still married to, to this day. His name is Gary Lampier, Gary and Marietta Lampier. Um, and ended up leaving their mother and the two boys. He had come back to visit a few times, but eventually just stopped coming. Um, so they were very, very, very involved in the church. Um, our grandparents were missionaries. My dad and, and Sandy were missionaries. In fact, my dad was born in Indonesia. Both my brothers have been to Indonesia multiple times when they were little doing missions. And so their mother, Sandy, um, quickly remarried to a man I think she met in the church named Larry Fulton. Um, and he ended up adopting my two brothers. And this was about when Jason was four. So it was about a year later or so, I believe. And then they ended up having two more children between the two of them. So in total, there's um, four, four kids that they're taking care of. When my brother was about 12 years old, which Larry would actually beat them with belts, with sticks. Eventually he had a, a, a handmade two by four with double handles that he would beat them with. Um, and that, and that started from, you know, whenever he was pretty young. Um, but about 12 years old, Larry started going into my brother's room at night and they had bunk beds, um, for late night prayer sessions. And he was started molesting them. Man, that's crazy. And yeah. I'm sure that abuse had a, I mean, even before, you know, he was doing the late night prayer sessions with him. I grew up at the kind of the same way you did. You know what I mean? My dad died. My mom wasn't in my life. I didn't really have parents. I had grandparents, but so, but when I did see my mom, you know, there was a lot of abuse and I know that affect me as a child. And then I can't even imagine with that on top of, you know, the late night prayer sessions, but 
So he didn't have an easy upbringing. No, and um, I think at some point, so this, the abuse goes on for about a year, the sexual abuse, okay. um, along with the beatings. And at some point they tried to tell Sandy and Sandy didn't believe them and actually called Larry into the room and said, you tell him what you just told me. And, you know, they yeah. eventually tell, say it, and he denies it, and she doesn't believe them. All of that happens. Um, so about a year, so a year goes by, and Joel is 17 at the time. And he tell he has a little girlfriend. He tells her what's going on. She's like, we got to get you out of there. So yeah. he... Yeah. So she, um, so he goes, she picks him up. They go up to the hospital, I guess, where Sandy's working. They steal her car. They, they take off, they report the car stolen and eventually the cops pick him up and they're going to take him back home. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He's like, I'm not going back there. Here's what's yeah. going on. Right. Like right. this, this, this going on. So an investigation started and uh, my brother, my, my Jason, actually was offended and actually hurt that Joel left him behind because he was like, man, how are you going to leave without me? Like, you know. Yeah, he so, probably felt scared being alone. Yeah. So, um, so an investigation started and um, Larry Fulton admitted to what he was doing and supposedly what he said, um, the reasoning or one of the reasons for doing what he was doing was to make sure that their penises worked is what he said what yeah oh so, my god man um sick anyways yeah so he ends up getting convicted um of molesting them keep in mind sandy and their church are supporting them through the entire thing jason remembers going into like church counseling sessions with the whole family and the church trying to tell them what to what they can't what they should and shouldn't say one of them was uh, make sure when they interview you or when they, when they, you know, um, you know, when they talk to you, when they start asking you questions that you tell them you've never ejaculated. And, um, yeah. yeah, so it was just really, everything was very weird. And as a mother of two girls, I just, I just don't understand the, the stance of the mom supporting Larry through the whole thing. So anyways, and then in the church too. So, so fast forward, Larry gets convicted. He gets um, sentenced, um, a three year suspended sentence, which basically means three years of probation. Right. Um, Joel is placed into foster family for the next year or so because he was 17, about to be 18. Um, oh, and, and also whenever they started um, talking to the boys and asking questions, you know, Joel gave everything. He spilled all the guts, right? Well, right. when they pulled Jason aside to talk to him, you know, Jason, he was 13 at the time. He um, was not fully truthful about everything. He didn't want to go against his parents. He didn't want to out his parents. Um, you know, he didn't want to go against his authority figures and it was scary for him. And so he didn't admit to everything that was fully going on as a 13 year old. And a lot of kids, you know what? I'm, I'm super proud of, of children who actually have the courage to stand up because majority of kids don't even, won't even bring it up, you know, like they're terrified. Yeah. So, I mean, it, well, when the mom is blowing it off, the church is blowing it off. You kind of, I can't even imagine. He was probably like, nobody cares about me. Like mm -hmm. it's not going to matter at this point if I say anything or I don't. Or what, what's going to happen to me if I do. Who, right. What is, that's what yep. is my mom? What is Larry going to do to me? You know? So he was terrified. He didn't fully fess up to everything. Um, so Joel ends up getting placed into foster care for the next year until he was 18. Jason, however, was sent back to be with Sandy. Um, and Sandy took Larry back in um, after he was convicted and didn't serve any prison. He went back home. So he was sent back home to father them. The other two children were left in the home. Um, so at that point, they were living in Anchorage, Alaska. So, you know, the, the capital, it's the biggest place, right, right, right. The biggest, bigger cities there. Um, so what they did is they packed up all three kids right immediately after that. Keep in mind, they were in public school, you know, normal, somewhat normal lives, you know, like going to public school and all that. Right. Um, but at this point, you know, they got, they didn't want to be publicized. They didn't want this outed. They want to hush, hush, dust everything under the rug. So they packed up all three kids and they moved them to Wasilla, which is in the Valley, a, a much smaller town because there was another faction of their church there. They began homeschooling the kids. 
Um, so they move into a town where they don't know anybody. They have no family. They have no friends. Um, they homeschool them so they don't have teachers or any other adult figures to talk to or anything like that. Um, and, you know, they start putting them in that church up there. So um, what Jason would do is he would get jobs. So he, he would crank out his homeschool, like he'd bust his butt and like do as much home, he'd do like, you know, four to six weeks worth of homeschool stuff and cram it into one week and just bust it out because he would go and he would get jobs outside of the home. Like he would go out on fishing boats. He would go out and do hunting, you know, long hunting things, just as, as much as he could get and stay out of the home for as long as possible. And then he would come home and he would crank out the school that he needed to get crank out and then he'd go back out. So um, when that was going on, was the, was Larry still like messing with him? I asked him, I said, so were the, did he continue to molest you after the conviction and moving to a cell? And he said, no. I said, did he continue to beat you? And he said, yes. So he was still beating him with the sticks and the two by fours and all that. Um, yeah. To the point where like he, there was some days he couldn't even stand up or sit down like it was one or the other because he was bruised from his lower back to his knees you know he said that he remembers sitting in church one time and the church was um coaching all the families on how to how and where to beat your child so that the authorities won't no, and it won't be noticeable. And it was between your butt and your knees is the best place because I don't remember the reason, but he, that's what he said. He, he remembers that too. And um, it's just the whole thing is just crazy. No, none of the authorities, no, nobody came back to check on him. Nobody did well checks on the kids. None of the family checked on him. And I find it really, really odd that maybe our father didn't get involved at this point. Because if you think about it, like I grew up with like no parents. He had three. He had his mom, he had our father, and then he had Chester, the molester. I like to call him Chester, <laughs> his adoptive father, right? Yeah. He had all three of those people and all three of those people have families behind them. And That's not a crazy. single person went to his aid, checked in on him, nothing. Yeah, so right? he literally felt like alone, I'm sure. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. When was it from that point on like did i know he ended up getting arrested for some stuff in the beginning mm -hmm. of you know his life when did that start compared to you know when this stuff was going on like what was the age gap until that started happening yeah so he was in wasilla for from 13 to 16 and it's kind of the same similar story as to what happened with joel he got a girlfriend he kind of told the girlfriend what had happened in the past and what was currently going on. And she said, oh, heck no, we need to get you out of there. And he literally climbed out of his window in the middle of the night to get away from that family, hopped in his girlfriend's car and left. Um, he did come back the next day to get his belongings, which were all in trash bags on the front porch. Um, locks were changed, you know, like he couldn't get into the house. Um, and they didn't, um, they gave him everything of his, of his, except for his ID, his social security card, and his birth certificate. They wouldn't give him any of that. Um, Why so do you think they wouldn't give him that? I don't know. I that's, don't know. That's weird. Like, we got this, so you better come back type thing is how I look at that. Yeah. I mean, like they he, have something hanging over him. You know what I mean? Yep. This <clears> piece <throat> of the story is important because he can't get a job later on. Because, right. Right. That's what I was just going to say. Yeah. So, so him and the, him and the girlfriend, they sell the girlfriend's vehicle, you know, they sell all their belongings or whatever. And at this time it was like, you could get plane tickets and get on planes without actually having your IDs and stuff. So they get a plane ticket to go down to Seattle, which is where Joel is. And he had okay. gotten in contact with Joel. Um, and, and keep in mind, he and Joel hadn't had contact since the conviction, like at all. I think that Joel was very angry with Jason for not being truthful and backing him up when it came down to right. asking about what was really going on in the home. Um, but then again, also Jason's argument to that is, well, you freaking like, you didn't do your part either. You left me in this home. Like if you hadn't gotten caught, well, would you ever come back for me? So he, they kind of have this, yeah, you know, yeah, they both kind of have a valid point, but I think it really goes back to that's what, when this stuff goes on in a home, that's 
that's what happens. It, it's dividing people. So then the truth can't really come out. Mm -hmm. Yes. And also, and, and I, I can make this argument for both sides is that they were children. Like you can't blame Jason for not fully fessing up to the full right everything because the fact that he fessed up to anything is huge because most kids won't say anything and then on on joel's behalf you know he was also still a child he was 16 he was 17 years old and you know him not taking his 13 year old brother i mean i get it you know he's a kid yeah. so i mean both of them i can i can see both sides and i can also see why they would both have some animosity towards each other so anyway so he gets in touch with joel joel says yeah you can come stay um with me and my i think it was his wife at the time so they get down to seattle um they buy a, a motorcycle for like 400 bucks and they what was it oh joel would not let them sleep in the house because they weren't married so they made him then sleep outside in joel's car i think yeah um, yeah because he couldn't have them under his roof um not married or whatever why is that because they were maybe having sex i, I don't know it oh was, okay, okay. and he, yeah, he was super weird. religious he still is super religious too so oh, okay. um so that was his his um his thing so anyway joel ends up going getting them an apartment and dropping both of them off there um and they never spoke again so um he said i'll set you up in an apartment so he goes and gets them this apartment here's the keys and it's an empty apartment in the ghetto, whatever, which obviously they're thankful for, but you know, they don't have furniture, they don't have food, they don't have money, they don't have anything at this point, um, but they have a shelter. So that's, you know, that's good. So a um, few days go by, they're sitting in there, they're sitting, he says, and it's funny because I didn't get this story um, out of my brother until, you know, a couple years into um, our relationship. And I, I asked him, I said, so do you remember committing your very first crime? which led you down your life of crime that you lived. And he said, absolutely. He said, and he told me the whole story about the apartment. And he said, me and my girlfriend were sitting there one day, sitting on the, on the living room floor, no furniture, eating food bank food. And I, I realized that we didn't even have any toilet paper to wipe our asses with. And so I hopped on the motorcycle and I went down to the corner store, went to the bathroom, unraveled a roll and stuck it in my helmet and I'm driving back home and I'm just racking my brain thinking, how am I going to get, oh, here, uh, I, the important part of the story, he actually gets a job when he gets to Seattle. He gets a job as a telemarketer and he worked for two weeks and he went to go pick up his paycheck. And the guy was like, listen, I got your check here, but I can't give it to you until you give me a form of ID. I need your ID in order to, you know, I have to put you in the system. And he didn't have it. Uh, obviously because his parents kept it. And so he was like, I can't give you this check. So of course, Jason quit the job because he's not going to work for free. Right. So anyway, so now he's driving back um, from grabbing, stealing some toilet paper from a bathroom at a convenience store. And um, he's like, how am I going to make money? How am I going to make money? And he's driving past a fitness center, like a, a, a gym. And he's like, I bet that people put their wallets in these lockers in there. So the next day he goes up there and says, Hey, can I try your gym out for a day? Um, you know, and see, you know, just to see if I want to get a membership. They said, sure. So he's like, I'll never forget. I went into the locker room, started opening lockers. And the first locker that I opened that had a wallet in it, I opened it up. There was like over $900 in it. And Damn. I thought we were rich. We were going to get to get some furniture, some food, you know, like, and that was, it was like, Oh my God, I only had to do that. And I have $900, you know? Yeah. And, so and, to, and to them, you know, having no money, then seeing 900, that seems like a lot of money. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. All right. So he's obviously now living in, living on the streets. I mean, he has an apartment, but he has nothing in it or anything else mm -hmm. for that matter. Like when was it in his life that he, that he came up with the idea to like, I'm going to go serve injustice mm -hmm. out myself. This is where uh, the media doesn't have it right too. And okay. a lot of people don't know this part of the story. So um, he, you know, so actually he ended up going to juvie at some point when he was 17, when he was in Spokane and he was so terrified of getting sent back to his parents, but they, he was so close to 18 at that point that they didn't send him. And that is when he would, there was a lady in there who actually helped him get his, do all the paperwork and file all the paperwork to get his ID and social and all of that. Okay. So he was finally able to do that at that time. 
However, he's already been in, you know, he's already started this and started all these committing crimes and stealing and thievery and all of this. So he does that. He, you know, he, he gets regular jobs in construction and, you know, doing all kinds of different things, but he's also, he also hustles on the side, you know, runs drugs, does credit card fraud, check fraud, you know, swapping tags, all this stuff. At, at, and at some point he meets his wife. Um, he was married for, I don't know how many years they were actually married for, but I know that they were together for about 17 years. Um, oh, wow. So yeah. um, a minute. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. And he was kind of young. He was like 18 or 19, I think, maybe even 17 when he met her. No, no, it, was, it might have been 18. I don't know. He was young. I know that. And she was a little bit older than him. And she was already doing things like, you know, swapping tags and different things. So he, she kind of got him into that. And they just lived this life of, you know, crime. And he would get jobs and get legit jobs, but they would also do all these things on the side. Right, right. Um, Anyways, um, eventually, you know, they drank, they smoked, they did whatever, like, you know, they did drugs, they did all this whole life. And eventually, you know, it kind of blew up and they split and she, um, you know, he was able to talk to the kids every once in a while, but, you know, eventually she cut him off from that. And at this point in his life, he was, you know, like, what do I have to lose here? Like, you know, and, and right. it seemed hopeless. Mm hmm. And there was things throughout his life that he did to help women and, and kids, little things, you know, like there was girls being sex trafficked and stuff like that, that he helped out and kind of saved just little stories along, uh, along the way. But at this point in his life, uh, he's still, he's down on the lower 48 and they have actually lived in a few states. It's not just in, you know, Washington. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and he actually decides when he's in the lower 48 that he's going to start, you know, talking to the communities that he's in, um, you know, like the gangster type communities and, and people who are scared of the police who won't call the cops uh, because they're scared and won't call the authorities because the authorities have either screwed them over or won't do anything um, and try to, you know, try to find out if there's any anything going on that shouldn't be going on that he can help out with. And so he, he does, he starts getting names and get, he, he starts getting lists of names. And what he does, his whole point of what he was doing was to scare these people into not doing what they were doing, not offending and committing these right, right. acts, right? And because his whole thing is, you know, jail time doesn't scare these dudes. You know, nothing's, you, you have to literally, it's fear. It's like the fear of bodily harm or, you know, what I'm, you know, your life's going to be taken away because that that's the only thing that's going to deter these people. And so he actually was doing committing these offenses down here in the lower 48 and going into people's houses and giving them a talking to and smacking them around. <laughs> and and, and these are people who are being, um, you know, that are people are reporting that they're currently offending. Right. They're currently and when you Absolutely. say offending, you're talking about like child molesters, right? Yes. Okay. Like, like somebody has said, my cousin's daughter is being molested by so-and-so, you know, and nobody's right. calling the authorities about it because, you know, nobody wants to, everyone's afraid of the cops, you know, nobody's, there's other illegal things going on over there that they don't want to get caught for, whatever it is, they don't call the cops and Jason would go find the people, he would look them up, he would go to the library, he would look them up on the internet, and he would go and um, scare them, basically, put the fear in them. So is that when he got caught the charges that he's currently incarcerated for?